Okay, well, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our next uh, speakers in our next uh, session. Uh, and um, uh, the first speaker is uh, Tor Weger. And uh, Tor is at the University of Colorado, and he's going to be talking about a neurobehavioral neuro model of pain and pain avoidance systems. And he's promised me that, unlike me, he's going to try to be on time. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different than what I do in most of my talks, which is I'm going to try to uh, give some context that provides a transition from animal to human studies. Um, and I hope complements some of the work that we've heard already. I think it fits in well, as far as I can see. Um, as Hippocrates wrote some years ago, I'd rather know the person who has the disease than the disease the person has. I think this is true for pain, especially in the context of what we're talking about today. Uh, like I said at the beginning of the whole session, a major motivator, motivator for me um, was realizing that so many people study pain um, by studying nociception <laughs> uh, still, and, and how little realization there is uh, of the whole person. And I think in this room, we don't all think like that, and that's why we're bringing together people who study early life adversity, people who study people and treat people, as well as, as the mechanisms. You know, but when it comes to studying the person, uh, it's unclear exactly how to break that down into brain systems and, and mechanisms. And so um, I'm going to attempt to do that by taking a slice through this and talking about two systems, uh, which I believe are largely but not always separable a system for pain experience, and a system for pain valuation. And first I'll talk a little bit about our representations of pain experience from an anatomical perspective. The classic textbook example or system is the spinothalamic pathway, which you see here. Um, and it projects to the, the thalamus and up to multiple areas, including the posterior insula and so on. There's also a spinal parabrachial amygdala pathway, which is uh, incredibly large and important as well, and it's receiving increased attention. I know Catherine uh, featured this in her 2013 Nature Reviews neuroscience uh, paper, review paper. Um, there's a spinal reticular pathway, and all these are going to become important here soon, uh, which projects directly to the PAG, the periaqueductal gray in the midbrain, my favorite area of the brain at the moment, and um, also spinal hypothalamic and spinal bulbar pathways. So there's lots of ascending pathways. Uh, I don't think that there's any one of these areas that receives no susceptive input that is not subject to descending modulation from uh, higher forebrain areas. And I'll just focus on one axis here, because I think it's relevant for the work today, which is uh, a pain valuation axis that connects the ventromedial prefrontal uh, cortex and nucleus accumbens system. And both Frank and Jing spoke eloquently about uh, aspects of this system earlier on. Uh, so when we think about a representation of pain experience, there are several different kinds of effects one could, uh, the, the pain valuation could have on the other processes. And I think we're still learning about when each of these different mechanisms applies. The first one is descending modulation, um, which I'm, um, I'm not going to say too much more about. I hope somebody else will, will talk in more detail about it, um, just for time reasons. But there are multiple descending pathways that influence the spinal cord that mediate multiple types of behavioral effects on pain. So you can get behavioral analgesia based on what you do, your social context, what you uh, eat, and whether you're pursuing food in particular. Um, and this is very related to Howard Field's motivation decision model of pain. You can have effects on central experience of pain. It's not about what's uh, happening, what changes that are happening in your spinal cord. It's about all of these complex cortical and subcortical processes that are generating pain. Um, and that captures another important aspect, but I'm going to focus uh, in this talk more on a third aspect, uh, which relates to what Frank talked about, which is about learned avoidance, which is given a certain uh, degree or type of nociceptive input and, and immediate pain experience, what does that mean for me and what do I do about it? And so this idea that we can learn that things are okay, acceptable or, or terrible and bad, I think is a strong driver of health behaviors. Uh, both immediately and also over time uh, in terms of how we sleep, how we exercise, what we eat, how we socialize. And those changes can compound over time to really create uh, a persistent problem or help in its resolution. Um, so I'm going to talk about two 
aspects of this. I'm going to first talk about sensitization, about the nociceptive transmission and that pathway, and then I'll talk about avoidance. Um, and for the sensitization, uh, a number of animal studies, I think, have done a really good job at demonstrating uh, that there's sensitization not only in your spinal cord, which is well established, but also in central brain circuits that are likely important for the generation of pain and its various autonomic and other uh, consequences. Um, so this is the spared nerve injury model that we'll talk about first, which is a, a, a part of basically cutting one of the nerve roots here. Um, you can see that down at the very bottom. This is multiple models um, of the sciatic nerve. Uh, and there are several different kinds of effects that, that we see when this happens. Um, one is gain amplification, so sensitization or stronger responses at multiple levels. Um, number two, uh, neurons that respond to nociceptive events, uh, they start to have larger receptive fields than they otherwise did. They respond to more parts of the body. Um, so there's more coverage. And responses uh, start happening in neurons that are normally not nociceptive at all, don't encode nociceptive properties, and then they begin to. You'll see that again <laughs> if you wanted to take a picture. Wait. <laughs> uh, all that. Uh, so here's a case study, and this is, um, this is from a paper that I find to be very special in this area by Steve Waxman's group. It's a rat model of, of diabetes. So um, uh, what happens is in this model there's a four time, fourfold increase in blood glucose. There's tactile allodynia. They assess it for seven weeks. And they're recording from part of the spinal thalamic pathway, the ventral posterior lateral um, thalamus, so they can demonstrate that those are nociceptive neurons. This is what happens with tactile allodynia. Let's see if I get my, my laser, one of the laser pointers okay here. Um, right. Um, let's see. There's, uh, yeah, this is the withdrawal threshold. Um, so in the pain model, it goes uh, way down. So there's a dramatic increase in sensitivity. Um, and if you look at the VPL neurons, they're hyper responsive. So the dark bars are the controls, the light bars are the uh, diabetic model. Um, and that's the summary of, of firing rates. So there's a dramatic increase. Um, uh, in fact, there's also an increase in spontaneous activity in these, um, in these neurons. Right? So there's a nine-fold increase in spontaneous firing in uh, these nominally nociceptive neurons. Um, and you can see that here in these raster plots that show the spikes. Um, so is this evidence for supraspinal plasticity uh, changes? Maybe, and this is where it starts to get really interesting. <laughs> So another part of this study is they make a cervical spinal transection. So they disconnect the thalamus from the afferent input. <laughs> so now the changes can't be secondary to peripheral changes or even uh, spinal changes. Um, if there's changes, it has to be supraspinal itself. And if you look at the arrestroprots here, um, now here, this is uh, after the spinal cord transection uh, versus the top line, which is spontaneous, just as, just as strong. The spontaneous activity in these neurons is just as strong <laughs> after spinal cord transection. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, there's no response to peripheral stimulation. So yes, the afferents are really cut. right? They no, they're not getting the spinal input, but something in their thalamus is firing spontaneously, uh, presumably driving uh, pain. Um, and this is a mapping of the receptive field areas on the uh, left there you see the control rat, on the right you see the rats with the um, neuropathic pain model, and there's you know fourfold increase in the area that's covered that, uh, by these neurons. So this to me helps explain part of the story about how you can uh, end up with, with pain maybe in one area after a nerve injury or, or some other condition, and all of a sudden the pain starts spreading to multiple areas. <laughs> You know, to me, as I said in the beginning of the whole session, this means, yeah, yeah this could be real. Um, I have little time, so I'm not going to go through many other examples. I'll just give you a little taste. But some of my other uh, favorite work um, has been done by Volker Nogebauer um, and colleagues, and also by Yaramar Karasquilo uh, at NCCIH. <laughs> uh, we'll come into the picture here. So this is an arthritis model. Um, so there's an, a, a knee injection of uh, essentially a pro-arthritic um, agent uh, there are neurons in the amygdala that um, are usually, well, so, some of them are, are nociceptive specific, some are not. Um, we're looking here at these multi-responsive neurons that respond to painful events and to touch events. Uh, they're sensitized across hours in the arthritis model. And so you can see that here on the left. Um, the top is the, um, what happens immediately, and then there's increases across time. Um, so you can just see that, that they start to really sensitize. <clears throat> 
They also, as in the thalamus, start to fire spontaneously. Um, and there's increases, um, not only in the firing, but um, in, in the gain of the neurons relative to their input across, across body sites. So this is pressure on the x-axis. As the pressure increases, the responses go up. Um, and in here, what they're showing is the gain increases in the arthritic model, which is the black line. <laughs> Um, another thing that they did, which is really neat, they showed that it's really the spinal parabrachial amygdala pathway that's probably really important um, by looking at responses to uh, parabrachial stimulation. And you can see what happens um, without the arthritis model. There's really not much of a response. And um, with the arthritis model, there's a huge response <laughs> to parabrachial stimulation. Um, so that's, ab again, above the neck <laughs> sensitization. Uh, they also find increases in the receptive field area, the coverage area. So, so to me, that's a very uh, consistent story. It's unlikely to be a function just of peripheral sensitization. It's really an example where it's probably brain plasticity that's driving that um, response. And interestingly, in the series uh, by Yarmar, Karasquil, and colleagues, plasticity markers, um, ERK is one such marker, uh, is increased after inflammation in, in the right amygdala. Um, and it uh, appears to be both necessary and sufficient um, to drive pain behavior in their studies. Um, so now I've just shown you two uh, examples of sensitization in two different ascending pathways. Uh, and this can happen at the level of the periphery, it can happen in the spinal cord, and it can happen above the neck as well. So I would say that there's sensitization of multiple, uh, at multiple levels, potentially. Um, so there's gain amplification, there's larger receptive fields, and there's responses to neurons that are normally not nociceptive and now are nociceptive. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Now I'm going to tie this into human work <laughs> a little bit. I'm going to talk about a study that uh, was, was just, um, in, is just now in press. Uh, and you might recognize um, my postdoc, Marina Lopez-Sola, because she's sitting right over there. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll look at fibromyalgia. And, we're, and what we're going to look at first is um, evidence for hypersensitivity in um, these ascending targets of nociceptive uh, input. Um, so fibromyalgia has been talked about a lot. It's a widespread condition involving musculoskeletal pain um, and also other multisensory uh, abnormalities, multiple sensitivities. Um, <clears throat> there's no really very well-established tissue pathology, although there's some nice work with microneurography and there's some work with uh, small fiber neuropathy um, that, that suggests that there are changes. Um, and um, as a result of two things, um, the lack of a definitive marker for fibromyalgia, uh, essentially, and, um, and secondly, because of its incredibly strong comorbidity with other kinds of conditions like fatigue, anxiety, depression, sensitivity to odors, sensitivity to light, <laughs> sensitivity to other things, then if you go into your average emergency room or probably neurology department, I think that what's going to happen is they're going to say, these aren't, people aren't real. This, this is, they have all these weird problems. We can't explain them. They're sensitive to everything. They're complainers. You know, when Sigmund Freud started writing his books, what he was focused on is hysteria, which I think is an antecedent to, to what we probably would now call you know, fibromyalgia, medically unexplained pain, somatization disorder, and other things. Um, so that's a problem. Uh, so here in this study, uh, Marina gathered, uh, collected 37 female patients, 35 match controls, um, and we'll, we'll look at fMRI during mechanical pain and also during a multi-sensory task. Um, so we'll ask two kinds of questions. One is, is there evidence for brain hypersensitivity in, in fibromyalgia to pressure, to, make, to painful pressure? Um, and secondly, is there evidence for other changes beyond pain in response to multi-sensory input? perhaps some of these other pathways or other central changes that might give us clues as to what's going on. Um, I'm going to take a little detour here. I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, pattern that we developed in the labs a few years ago now, um, because this is a probe for, uh, for mechanical pain sensitivity. So we're calling it the neurologic pain signature, because that's what the editors of our journal required that we call it. Uh, they, uh, it really, that's really true. And um, it's, what it is, it's just a pattern of activity 
um, including many areas that we know and love, like the anterior cingulate, the anterior and mid insula, uh, the uh, ventrolateral and medial thalamus, um, posterior, dorsal posterior insula, and secondary somatosensory cortex. And, and all of these areas play uh, well established and, and varied roles in pain. So we think they're each doing different things. Um, but overall, it's really activity in this whole system that we're going to use as, a, as an indicator uh, for pain, for, for the magnitude of pain. And um, another point is that it's not just that there's activity in these areas that's important. There are many cases in which there's, there's fMRI activity in these areas, but um, there's no pain. Uh, it's, it's not just that you have activity in some of these areas. It's this particular pattern with this particular kind of center surround pattern here. It's this part of the cingulate. It's this part of the insula. It's this part of the thalamus, et cetera. And that's what I think makes this relatively unique uh, and helps us to find the results that I'll show you in a second. So the idea is we trained this, we identified the optimal pattern on one sample, and we can apply that to new individual uh, participants or patients from multiple samples. And um, what we do is we just look at the pattern match. So we take this whole pattern, we feed in a brain image, like activity during some condition, and we get a number. How strongly is this pattern expressed? And as we collect those numbers from different patients, we can say, well, are the numbers high only when pain is happening, or are they high at other times as well? Um, and this is just an example uh, of, of one prospective test in a different study. And we'll see what happens when people get low, medium, and high painful heat. Um, so this is from a study that, that we published recently. Um, and you can see each line is one individual person. And on the right, we're just plotting whether indeed we have an increase in the brain marker with an increase in the uh, pain for that person. So there it is, and in this particular sample, 96% of the people show the response in the right direction, uh, and that's very typical across different studies. So that's kind of an illustration of how it can work. Um, right now, we've been gathering data from a, a set of collaborators, which is very exciting for me. I love this process. Uh, basically, we can apply it to data from all over the world, from all different kinds of groups and populations, and we can really ask, when I know that there's some increase in the level of pain in one condition versus another condition, how well can we detect that at the individual person level? <laughs> um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details about this because um, it's not, I want to get back to the main topic of, of the rest of the talk. Um, but uh, I'll give you one example and then a summary. And the one example is a really fun collaboration, because we didn't have to collect the data, uh, <laughs> involving gastric and rectal and esophageal uh, painful and uncomfortable stimulation. So this is with um, Lucas van Audenhove, Michik Okano in Japan, and um, Belgium in Japan, basically. And, and this is a plot of the responses to, um, to painful pressure versus a resting baseline. That's what they have in this study. And um, as you can see, each dot is a person. There's a gastric pain on the left. There's two different studies, a rectal pain on the right. Uh, again, we're above the 90% mark um, for, for you know, detecting the response in individual people. Um, so it does transfer across um, certain kinds of visceral pain, at least. And we can start to look at its, uh, what I call the psychological receptive field. Across studies, what's the set of conditions that do activate it, and what's the set of conditions that don't activate it? And that can help us establish the boundary conditions for what this thing is really measuring. Is this really a measure of pain? Is it a marker of pain? And so far, this is what we see. It's activated by... Uh, noxious pressure, shock, and heat, gastric, esophageal, re rectal distension, vaginal pressure, it's painful, <laughs> um, all those things. Uh, and what's it not activated by uh, so far? Well, um, negative pictures, disgusting pictures, uh, looking at the person who rejected you, <laughs> social rejection, uh, observe pain, looking at pain in other people, anticipating pain, getting so-called fear or threat cues, um, um, certain as it doesn't respond to, to cognitive demand in and of itself. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't respond to differences in task state itself. Um, we can talk more about that. It uh, doesn't re respond to pain recall when you're judging pain. It doesn't respond to non-painful warmth. This is important uh, in a sense because this, this set of conditions is, in some sense, a hand-picked set of conditions because these are all things that people claim activate pain processing areas in the brain. <laughs> and the problem is our measures have not been specific enough <laughs> to be able to discriminate uh, painful heat from those other things. So, so far in these tests, it's sensitive and specific to somatic pain. There are some references there. Um, and we can use this, these results to, to refine our, our view of what construct is actually being measured by this pattern and improve it. Um, but to the degree that we uh, believe that this is a provisional marker that's a little bit better than what we've had before, 
we can go back and ask this question about fibromyalgia. So let's see what happens with fibromyalgia patients to, when they respond to thermal pressure. The other task that they did was a multi-sensory uh, paradigm where they listen to music and see flashing checkerboards and press buttons all at once. <laughs> uh, so it's, and they find it to be aversive. All right, and so we'll look at the NPS responses to the pressure. Um, we'll look at, uh, this is a picture from one of Vanya's studies, which he may or may not talk about, but it's ventromedial PFC, nucleus accumbens connectivity, which he found predicted persistent back pain. So we'll look at this system, because this is a key part of my valuation system, uh, so-called evaluation system, and then we'll look, at, look, look for changes in, in sensory cortex and, other, um, and, and this valuation system when people are getting these other multisensory things. So what happens when they're getting painful pressure? Well, here's a group of controls um, with moderately painful pressure, uh, 4.5 kilograms per centimeter squared. There's the controls with six kilograms, more painful. So we can validate that, yes, it works in this sample for painful pressure. And now let's see what happens with the fibromyalgia patients at the low intensity stimulus. There, the response is as strong as the high intensity stimulus in the controls, greater than the low intensity stimulus. So here you have the same pressure and you have greater NPS responses uh, in, the, in the patients. And there's also greater pain, as I'll show you. We can break this down into different subregions, and we can say, yep, it's expressed in the anterior cingulate part of this pattern, and in the posterior insula part of this pattern, and in the thalamus part of this pattern. It's pretty similar um, all over the place. <laughs> uh, so we don't think that it's, it's in one region and not others. Um, and about a third of the sample has clear hypersensitivity. And interestingly enough, when Jordi Serra did his microneurography experiments, that's what he found too. It's about a third of the patients that really showed clear evidence for, um, for um, spontaneous uh, peripheral neural activity. <laughs> so this could be driven by increases in peripheral input. We don't know. Maybe it is. Um, those increases in the NPS mediate um, hypersensitivity in patients. So what I'm showing you here is if you have fibromyalgia, you show a greater signature response, like I just said. If you show a greater signature response across both groups, then you report more pain unpleasantness. <laughs> and this is true for pain sensory and un, uh, pain intensity judgments and unpleasantness judgments. And we could talk more about that um, as well. Okay. Um, and what about this multisensory pattern? So we basically use the same kind of pattern finding procedure we used before to uh, identify a pattern that's predictive of um, fibromyalgia status in response to these non-painful events. So this is about something that goes beyond uh, just sort of pain sensitivity itself. And I'll just point out, you know, there's, we could spend a lot of time interpreting this pattern, but I want to point out a couple of things. And one of these is enhanced responses in this uh, frontal parietal um, default mode uh, network in other parts of the operculum. And especially the, well, both of those areas that you see circled on the top are, are um, connected to the ventromedial PFC and I think are really important in this uh, process of valuation uh, of the motivational significance of pain that I talked about earlier. Um, there's reduced activity in essentially extrastriate sensory and other parahippocampal regions. Um, and this is not about pain at all. It's just about how they respond to other things, other sounds and sights. Okay, so now we can put those two things together and we can classify them and we can get a fair estimate of how well could we classify a new person uh, and whether they have fibromyalgia or not. Uh, and the upshot is across both of these measures and there's a third measure as well I won't tell you about, uh, we can do a pretty good job, about 93% um, accuracy at telling whether somebody's got fibromyalgia or not. Yeah. Now, a while back, I had lunch with Rick Harris, who studies fibromyalgia. Our results converge with his. I think changes in the so-called default mode connectivity with the insula has been important for his work and for Vitaly Napadao's work um, with, with chronic pain, so there's convergence. So Rick says, well, I, you know, I, don't need, I don't need this to tell me who's got fibromyalgia, because I already know. <laughs> I can assess you know, widespreadness. I said, yeah, but maybe this is going to tell us something about which different patients have which different problems. <laughs> um, and so the way I see, I see it, this knows, well, I'll tell you the result first, and I'll tell you my interpretation. Okay, so <laughs> fibromyalgia. You have these three sets of, of changes. Okay, so we have increases in the NPS during nociception. That predicts increased pain reports during fMRI. That's the immediate hypersensitivity element of it, right, which may be relevant for their spontaneous chronic pain or may, maybe not, but it is, might be a, an endpoint in itself. Um, the changes in what we call this nociception negative NPS, but including the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is this value encoding region, um, predicts depression symptoms and uh, reported disability. 
right? Not the hypersensitivity part. Um, so there's that, and what we think is happening is that the VMPFC usually goes down when pain is high in healthy people. But here, in these patients, the relationship is reversed. It's, it's responding more positively. <laughs> so it's pro-pain instead of anti-pain. So there's a shift in the balance, <laughs> uh, which we, might think, we think might be important. The multisensory pattern, uh, the strength of this predicts spontaneous clinical pain. <laughs> so now we have three potential ingredients. You know, there's the mediation. Um, there's some correlations uh, with that. And there are some correlations with that. So it's preliminary. There's only 35 patients here. Uh, you know, but, um, but we think this gives us some clues that uh, different patients might have um, different brain pathologies that underlie different parts of this uh, whole cluster of fibromyalgia symptoms. Now, when we think about the whole person, again, I'll transition to the last part of the talk, which is we think about uh, uh, fear and avoidance and what, not just what's coming in, not just the, the pain you experience in the moment, but about its consequences for the person. And so this is where I think these ideas like the fear and avoidance model of chronic pain are very important. You know, so it starts here, you have an injury, you experience some pain, uh, you're okay, you confront the pain, you're not afraid, you keep doing stuff, and you recover, right? On the right, on the left, you start really worrying about it, thinking about it. It's almost as though you're training your attentional systems or your motivational systems to respond to that pain as very important all the time. So even if the initial nociception is then resolved, uh, what's happening is your mind is saying, whatever I'm feeling in my back or my neck or whatever it is, really important. <laughs> Pay attention to that. Avoid things that are associated with it and you end up with a whole host of different things. You know, not only fear and hypervigilance, but disuse, inactivity, uh, changes that cascade across time uh, that I hope people like Lance McCracken will talk about later <laughs> and others. <laughs> right. um, so I think this is a process of learned avoidance. Whatever signals are coming up through your spinal cord are really significant and really bad. Um, and over time, more and more stuff is associated with pain. I'm going to go back to the VMPFC and say a couple more things about it because it turns out as expected, it's not just important for uh, the regulation of pain and valuation of pain. It's important for a number of different things. Um, I'll try to be quick. I won't go into this in detail, but uh, there's a review that we wrote in, uh, a few years ago and a couple new ones out <laughs> coming out. Um, and it's been called uh, by Joel Price, the anatomist, visceromotor cortex it is strongly visceroactive. So it will, it's stimulating it will produce changes in the autonomic nervous system. Um, stimulating will produce, uh, and lesions will also affect um, neuroendocrine responses, HPA axis responses. Um, <clears throat> it's also really important for, for fear and threat regulation and for stress, the kind of stress that, that uh, people experience when they're giving a public speech, for example, uh, seem to be mediated largely through changes in this system in connection with the PAG. So the system isn't just about, uh, about pain. <laughs> okay. um, and what's really interesting, if you look at all these things, um, there's a kind of constellation of things. It's not random. <laughs> um, it's threat, stress, autonomic stuff that I told you about, implicated in mood disorders, but it also responds very strongly when you're thinking about how things relate to you. If you're judging how something relates to the self, it's a very reliable effect. If you're recalling autobiographical memories, even if you're recalling semantic memories, um, it turns out, uh, and when you're imagining future or other potential outcomes, this is very strongly responsive. Um, so VMPFC is, we think it's really important, I think it's really important for representing events and situations in relation to your concept of the self. And I'm happy to talk about that more. So how do we boil that down to a, uh, a sort of a simple paradigm that we can do in humans or potentially animals in the scanner? So here's the paradigm. Um, and it's an operant learning paradigm, so you have to choose one of two choices on a trial, circle or square. <laughs> And one of those is going to give you pain some of the time, or each one's going to give you pain some of the time. The probabilities that each is associated with pain are shown by the blue and the green lines there, and they drift over time so that people have to continuously learn, well, which one is bad now? <laughs> and that's how we can study the learning process. And you know, we use a basic computational model of avoidance to model this. So the idea is you make a prediction about pain, that this is going to happen, something bad is going to happen. You compare that with what happens when you get the experience. And if it's worse than expected, 
you update your prediction. So for example, if you were to get a stimulus like this one, uh, most of us would just not do that again, right? <laughs> Unless you're rewarded for this, like these people are in films, all right? So they're rewarded, they're gonna keep doing this, obviously. But, you know, so you generate this aversive prediction error, you learn, you update your prediction, and your predictions guide your choices, right? Prediction's negative, don't do it again. Um, and that leads to avoidance. So there's this cycle, predict, decide, learn that really kind of ties together three different literatures in a way. It ties together uh, work on threat learning and fear conditioning, work on pain physiology, and work on decision making in this cycle, which are usually treated in separate literatures. Um, so um, this is, of course, adaptive, but there are negative long-term consequences of avoiding too many things because you never go back and experience the things that you decided were bad and you're not going to do again, right? So there's a classic problem that you short-circuit the learning process. So in the brain, we'll just make some predictions for what happens in our task when, uh, if, if a brain area is tracking these different kinds of signals. So if a brain area is tracking the um, prediction signal here, its activity should look like this. It doesn't care about the pain that you got, it cares about the relationship with expectations. <laughs> and that's what that line graph means. Uh, an area of the brain that encodes a prediction error shows a series of, of, of effects it's always higher when the pain is on, because it's always worse than expected. It is activated in inverse proportion to your expectations, so it's high when the pain is unexpected. And if pain or no pain is fully predicted, there's no response. Right? So this is just the criteria for what happens if it's tracking a prediction error. And so we'll apply that to the brain <laughs> to look for these areas. And I'll give you the summary take home <laughs> in, in 30 seconds, uh, which is, um, the one area of the brain that really tracks the aversive prediction errors, worse than expected, is the PAG. <laughs> um, if you look at the ventral striatum, which is implicated a lot in reward prediction errors, for example, we don't see any response. Um, and what's in, what are the areas in the brain that track uh, the expectations, that respond to expectations? And the main area, and there's a few other ones that are a circuit, uh, is the VMPFC. <laughs> So it responds to the um, degree that you think that the pain's not going to come. This is a good option. <laughs> and that's consistent with lots of other reward literature. I'm going to cut to the chase here and say we did a lot of other uh, analyses of the network dynamics and circuits, and we attempted to essentially build a process model of this updating and learning process. And this is just the summary of what that would look like at the end of the day. Uh, when you expect to be able to avoid something, you expect it to say not be so bad, you have activity in the green circuits there. So there's the, there's the parts of the striatum, parts of the, and the hippocampus and the BMPFC. That feeds into the PAG. It's compared with what's coming in through that rubrospinal pathway that I talked about before. Right? Maybe direct input. Um, it's possible. And then there's a, a, an error that's generated. When the pain is worse than expected, you update the expectation in BMPFC. And you also update a set of areas that's in blue, which we think are related to updating the action policy, the consequences of pain for, for what you do in terms of your skeletal motor behavior um, and avoidance. So that kind of ties into what Frank said. So there's the negative expectation, there's the prediction error, and there's the, the value updating that determines what the policy is that you're going to follow. <laughs> um, and I won't have time to talk about it, but um, you know, in very brief, there's a couple points to make. One, we replicated the entire thing in a second study <laughs> with 50 people. Um, PAG, worse than expected signals, are sensitive to cognitive expectations. You can manipulate them with instructions. So it's not just about sort of low-level learning, it's probably also about your beliefs. And this leads me to the last uh, point that I'll, I'll, I'll try to make here, um, which is that uh, we'll hear more later, I think, about how various kinds of, of cognitive behavioral strategies work. There's a tremendous literature on these things. We can improve our pain for, for many patients, um, but it's still, I think, to me, under-recognized. So what's the circuitry for that? Well, in some earlier work that we did, we identified a pathway that, again, connects the ventromedial PFC, nucleus accumbens, to reappraisal success, which means if you have to look at a picture like this one and reframe it and say, this is not so bad, this is not real, it's a movie set. It's just a prop. <laughs> Yeah, I don't feel so bad, right? The more people are able to do that, the greater they show activity in this pathway. <laughs> um, so that's individual differences. When people are reappraising pain, they're either imagining that it's burning, bubbling, horrible, and the pain goes up in yellow, or they're imagining it's like a warm blanket on a cool day, and the pain goes down, <laughs> right, that they report, and that's the blue line there. <laughs> 
Um, so that works. But what mediates that uh, in the brain, that effect, is this pathway again from the nucleus accumbens to MPFC. And we think that's independent of activity in these sort of classic pain sensory pathways. <laughs> it's really a separate effect that's feeding into pain. Um, I'll just make a quick point that um, these areas, if, if the VMPFC is important for self-regulation, that means that this is something that we can modify by changing our thinking and our behavior. Um, but of course, this is the area that shows the most consistent changes uh, with chronic pain and with other kinds of stressors. So all these blue dots here are results from a study um, that showed a, a decrease in measured gray matter density with pain. Uh, Paul Geha and Vanya Karian did, I think, the first work on this, I think. It's great you know, work in, in brain some years ago and more since then. Uh, Dave Seminowitz and Catherine Bushnell have done rodent models of this, showing ca the causal effects of a chronic pain model on gray matter changes in pain, and really a whole bunch of awesome work that I don't have time to talk about um, that's coming out in the last couple of years um, from animal neuroscience showing structural remodeling of, of neurons in this circuit with chronic pain uh, models, spared nerve injury models. So in summary, you know, a sort of a picture of some of what's happening with chronic pain. Um, I think we have increased sensitization potentially in multiple pathways depending on the pain model. We have reduced uh, pain regulation, which could be reduced descending modulation, but it could also be uh, take the form of increased avoidance and uh, changes in the motivational significance of pain, independent of, of the immediate pain experience. Um, and so this might be linked to broad changes in motivational tuning uh, beyond pain itself. So um, I'll leave you with this quote, which I, I like. Um, Rene Dobos said some years ago, modern medicine will become only scientific, really scientific, only when physicians and their patients have learned to manage the forces of the body and mind. I think that's what we're exploring here today. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.